In my last devlog, I left my game looking like this. I think describing this using the word game is being a bit generous. I don't want to get buried so deep in the tooling of the engine that I forget to actually, you know, make the game. So I think adding sprites and animations to my custom entity component system would be a nice compromise to give the game an identity. When creating a sprite component, it's tempting to just create a class called sprite, which might hold a reference to the sprite sheet texture, as well as some other parameters, such as the origin and size, which would describe which part of the sprite sheet you'd like to show. So for example, in this sprite sheet, the origin might be 64 by 64, and the size would also be 64 by 64, resulting in an endpoint of 128 by 128, which would select this part of the sheet to be a single sprite. There could also be some other function in the class to render the sprite out. Then in the sprite component, I simply just store a pointer to that sprite and in the system just render it out. This is an example of a bad use of components. To understand why, we need to understand data locality. Historically, CPUs have improved a lot faster than RAM, like a lot. This means that your CPU will oftentimes wait around for RAM to retrieve things. To fix this, processors implement what's called a cache, which is like a mini RAM that sits on your processor and can be accessed much, much faster than main memory. When you retrieve something from RAM, it gets stored in the cache temporarily, so you'll be able to access it quicker. Not only that, but the processor also takes some neighboring data from RAM as well, since it predicts that you'll probably end up needing those too. And by the merit of being in the cache, it'll end up being a lot faster than constantly going back and forth between your program and RAM. This is why in the last video, I was storing components in lists that don't store component pointers, but the components themselves. This ensures components are sequential in memory, so when we get one transform, the OS might pick up another 50 and put them into the cache, since they're neighbors. Unlike pointers that would just store it in whatever address the OS gives it, which means more RAM traversal, which means slower performance, since we're not using the power of the cache. Back to the sprite component, it's clear now why this is a bad implementation. There's some indirection here since I'm storing a pointer, which means the sprite data won't be stored sequentially, slowing the program down. So how do we implement a sprite component correctly? The better approach would be to store the data associated with a sprite in the component itself and operate on that data using the system. So I end up storing a pointer to a texture which contains the sprite sheet and the origin and size to retrieve a specific sprite from the sheet as I explained before. But hold on, didn't I just say I want to avoid using pointers in components? In this case, it's actually fine since I'm only planning to have maybe five to 10 sprite sheets in the entire game. This means that although each component stores a pointer to a texture, many will be referencing the same ones, which means that the value of the pointer will end up in the cache since it's being used so frequently. So, as a general rule of thumb, pointers to commonly used or large resources in a component is fine, but pointers to unique and small data usually ends up ruining the performance benefit that comes with ECS. Using this as my sprite component, I could start to write a system that renders out the sprite. I start by getting the sprite and using the origin and size of the sprite to define two points, sprite start, which is the upper left point of the sprite, and sprite end, which is the bottom right, defining a rectangle for the sprite selection within the sheet. I then initialize a rendering sprite, not to be confused with a sprite component, which is just a container of data the renderer uses to know how to render out any sprite. All it needs is a reference to the sprite sheet and four UV coordinates, one for each of the four vertices of a quad. By setting the UV coordinates, I could specify what part of the sprite sheet I want to crop using a function I wrote called calculate UVs, which turns the pixel values of the rectangle defined by sprite start and sprite end into UV coordinates between 0 and 1, which is the format the shaders need. Then I pass that sprite object into my render sprite function and it'll be rendered to the screen. After all that was done, I made some concept art and test sprites for the game to help decide on a style. I made a lot of different proportions for the main character, but the one I'm choosing for testing the game is definitely not the most complicated one, but there's beauty and simplicity. And there we go, some trees, a character, and the scene is already looking nicer. The world is awfully static though, so I think animations are due. An animation component will store a map of animations with the name of the animation as a key and an animation list as a value. Each animation list will just be an array of animation frames, and each animation frame contains some info, such as an origin and size, which will be used to tell the sprite component what part of the sprite sheet it needs to sample from, a duration, which is how long the frame should last in seconds, and elapsed, which tells us how long it's been since this frame of animation has started. All in all, the animation component will look something like this, with the map I talked about earlier, as well as the current frame in the selected animation list, and the currently selected key in the map so we know which animation to index. The animation system will actually be inserted into the system where we deal with sprites, but just before rendering the sprite component, we'll use the animation component to adjust the sprite as needed. 
First, I get the animation component as well as the current animation frame in the animation list. Then, I set the sprite's origin and size to that of the current frames in the animation. After that, I increment how much time has elapsed since the frame was selected. And once that amount of time exceeds the duration of the frame, I reset elapsed and proceed to select the next frame of the animation. Then, once we reach the end of the animation list, I loop it back to the beginning so it could start over. And that's it. The rest is handled by the logic I made to render out the sprite component, and all the animation component is doing is just adjusting the sprite component. To actually make an animation, the code might look something like this in my scene. I create two frames for my idle animation, and then set the appropriate properties. The origin and the size correspond to the pixel values of the rectangle I'd like to crop the sprite sheet by, as shown here. Then, I set how long each frame should last as a duration, and compile an animation list using the frames I made. I then create an animation component and add it to the player, and using that component, I add the animation list I just made to the map of animations with the key of idle. I then set idle as the selected key in our map, and I also set the current frame to zero, so it starts from the beginning of the animation. I did the same thing for a walking animation, and this is the result. The character looks a lot more alive now as he walks and idles around the scene. Alright, that's it for this devlog, see ya.